Good morning, everyone. Well, uh, I'm just out here on my balcony, uh, enjoying a beautiful sunny day. Uh, I'm trying to depressurize from the four or five days of hectic work uh, leading up to the uh, post, uh, the introductory post for uh, steam film. Um, so we're looking for some good things, obviously, from that. But I kind of want to get back into a little something uh, different today, something that we started out doing uh, uh, until we got a little sidetracked by all the details uh, that uh, we needed to address regarding steam film. And uh, that subject matter that I want to get back to is a little more about my experiences and whatnot, people I've been dealing with in the past in my short-lived uh, uh, film career, uh, feature film career in particular, uh, and uh, the people and whatnot that I've maybe had the good fortune to meet, etc. So, you know, there's one thing that came to mind uh, while I was doing, uh, working on the steam film thing, uh, and that was uh, um, a very interesting evening. Um, I was fortunate enough to get to spend with Sal Minio. Now, I'm sure a lot of you don't know who Sal Minio is, but uh, he's quite a remarkable actor uh, and uh, quite a remarkable guy. Uh, he's done some pretty significant work. Uh, I would have to say that probably his most interesting uh, film that he did, or the most interesting film that he did, was Rebel Without a Cause, uh, working alongside uh, James Dean uh, and uh, Natalie Wood. Now, you know, I kind of started thinking about that the other day and I never really put much thought into that meeting. Uh, it's just something that happened, wasn't orchestrated. Uh, but now that I think about it, it's got to be one of the most interesting evenings that I've probably spent in my life. Uh, I mean, how many people today can actually say they have a direct connection uh, to, uh, to uh, James Dean and uh, Natalie Wood, in this case through Sal Minio? Uh, coupled with the fact that the film itself was pretty uh, mind-boggling and uh, a real earth shaker at the time, I think it was done in 1955. Uh, but let me tell you how it all came about. I was in a gay bar uh, probably the uh, the uh, certainly the center uh, of the uh, uh, gay community in Toronto uh, back in the um, uh, back in the uh, mid 70s, uh, and um, I was there with a couple of friends. But I believe, if I'm not mistaken, they went somewhere. I think out to get a beer or something because these bars back then they weren't allowed to have beer. Uh, Basically, it was a, uh, I guess you'd call it a social bar uh, or a dance club without any liquor whatsoever. Of course, needless to say, uh, that didn't mean there wasn't stuff there that you could get <laughs> to enjoy the night. I'm telling you, it was a pretty wild time when you think about it. Back then, it was all, uh, well, gosh, uh, yellow jackets, ionomen, uh, acid, uh, uh, purple micro dot, uh, uh, quaaludes, uh, you know, something it was a wild time, and I don't want to imply that you know that uh, it was all just for the sake of drugs. What it was is an incredible escape for a lot of uh, young gay men, uh, kicked out of the house or whatever it may be. And this was a night that was only open, the bar was called the Manatee. And it was only open uh, roughly, I think, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday night. So come Friday, everybody was uh, prepping to get uh, out and go to the Manatee. It was a huge dance floor. And I'll tell you, the music of that era uh, just pounded away uh, from the minute the doors opened. And it opened late, quite frankly. Nobody really ever got in there until about midnight. But it was just going strong right through till uh, uh, five o'clock the next morning. I say that because it was somewhat clandestine. Uh, they were running battles uh, with the police at that time. Uh, they would stand out and take stock of people going in and so on, etc. And that's probably another story. 
but so if you can think about this being clandestine a place that was rampant with illegal drugs uh, and yet it was a home shall we say uh, for uh, a lot of young men uh, and it was rather uh, adventuresome I mean really you're sort of on the borderline of uh, some pretty uh, exciting stuff, some pretty exciting times. So now if you can picture that atmosphere, and I happened to be in there, and this was about 12 o'clock, I think, and I look up, and there weren't a lot of people there at this point in time. I don't know, there may be, uh, I'm going to say 20 people at the most, probably, probably a whole about 300, illegally 300, maybe legally 150 but it was a really energetic place. And of course, it had a great reputation, uh, not only uh, in Toronto, but quite frankly, I think uh, uh, across North America, at least in gay circles. So it was quite surprising as I'm standing there, there were two levels to the dance floor. You could stand up uh, on this wall that had sections cut out of it so you could look over the dance floor. It was all about, you know, watching the men dance, etc. Who am I kidding? If that and the drugs were the two big things, and who you're going to go home with at the end of the night, right? So I'm standing there, and I'm by myself, I remember, and I looked out across the floor, and I saw this person just come down the stairs from the entrance and was walking across in front of a stage that they had set up. And I looked, and I'll be damned if it wasn't Salminium. And uh, there was no real place uh, uh, for you to sit in. In, in, in this bar there were a couple of tables but so he was kind of scoping it out and he came by uh, where I was standing and of course I'm just astounded at this point because I had watched him in these movies and he stood beside me uh, and you know there wasn't a lot doing so there was this pregnant pause and I thought I gotta say something right so I said well you know uh, I said, uh, Mr. Minio, I said, the place is, uh, is becoming a buzz with your presence. And he smiled. And he says, you think so? And I said, well, for the 20 people that are here, I'd say so. Anyways, we struck up this conversation. Uh, and he was very friendly, really nice guy. And, um, and you know, you get past the, the, you get past the sort of... Uh, uh, politeness and whatnot and then you get down into it and you realize that well he's there probably for the same reason everybody else is there he's trying to scope out uh, the men on the floor or I don't know maybe trying to meet somebody anyways or just dance but anyways he was very open he was very friendly uh, uh, and uh, he started asking me questions about Toronto and asked me questions about the bar and you know and uh, I was uh, older than him by that, not a lot older back then, uh, but uh, I certainly was older than him, I think. Uh, and uh, I couldn't help but bring up some of the stuff that I had reason to believe it happened. This was again before the internet, right? So you couldn't just, you know, when you were looking for something, uh, on, you know, you just couldn't. Uh, you just couldn't uh, uh, Google it. I mean, you actually had to do some research. And I remember, you know, wanting to read more and more and more about uh, Rebel Without a Cause. Uh, and the reason is that it was probably a pinnacle for the uh, gay movement uh, because it really did portray, you know, uh, homoerotic, uh, homoerotic uh, um, scenes and whatnot between Sal Mineo and um, uh, and James Dean. Now we all had the belief. Well, I think I knew for some reason. I don't know why. Maybe read it somewhere that Sal Mineo was gay. Uh, but everybody was curious, obviously, about James Dean, right? And there had been rumors about him being bisexual and. And, and whatnot, and I'm sure those rumors have pretty well been confirmed today, although I haven't followed up on it. You could Google it and follow up, follow up on it yourself. But I remember there was one line uh, that I read somewhere, and I'm not sure just where it was. And it was a really interesting line because apparently 
you know, they were going for this, this homoerotic relationship between uh, Dean and uh, Salminio, who's playing, Salminio was Plato in the movie, a young, a young boy actually, maybe 15, 16, I think they were playing around 16, maybe even 17, but he looked a lot long, younger, just go and look some pictures, look up some pictures. But what was fascinating was there was this line, and the line was uh, that I had heard had been said by uh, James Dean to uh, Salminio in this really uh, very erotic scene between the two of them. Uh, and he said, uh, supposedly, uh, he said, look, look at me like I look at Natalie. Because that's all you could do at this time. If there was even a hint of, well, maybe not a hint, but if it was become blatantly obvious that you were talking about a homosexual relationship, between the two characters in the in the film, it was probably it would probably be censored. Uh, in fact, I do know now that there was a letter sent to Warner Brothers that said you must not have any mention whatsoever of homosexuality in this movie, because there was word going out that uh, Nicholas Ray, the director, was really wanting to portray a slice of life, and that's what this movie was—a slice of life uh, in its early stages, as portrayed in film, because it was just, you know, on the cutting edge, no question about it, and. That line, I just had to get some confirmation on. I just, and I, I think I maybe was a little forward, but then I said to him, so I gotta ask you, <laughs> did uh, James Dean actually say to you, uh, you know, in that homoerotic scene in particular, look at me like I look at Natalie? Uh, and uh, he confirmed it. Uh, he, but he confirmed it. He did, I don't think he said those were the exact words, but yes, he confirmed the fact that that's what they were going for, and that's what James Dean wanted to go for, uh, which is really interesting because, of course, it was pretty risky, very risky back in those days. I'm not going to ruin the movie for you, obviously. You've got to see it yourself. You really should, really. Uh, but uh, you'll see what we're talking about. It was that cutting edge of film. And then the talk got to uh, some pretty interesting stuff of the moment. You know, I asked him what James Dean was like. I said, was he, was he friendly? He said, very friendly. And if he liked you, you know, uh, he was uh, he was very, uh, I'm trying to think exactly what his words were, uh, he was very uh, uh, open and comfortable with you. And that was, like, there was no, there was one James Dean uh, and uh, that was the James Dean. If he was friendly, uh, if you were friends with him, you really got to know the guy. At least that's what he implied. You know, and I, I believe he said, if, well, this is a long time ago now, but I believe he said to me something along the lines that uh, uh, they were friends for quite a while. So we started talking about, you know, the moment, why he was there and whatnot. And he kind of took a shine to a young guy that worked uh, at the uh, at the Manatee, uh, he was a guy that'd be going around, uh, sort of a busboy, picking up all the bottles and whatnot. His name was Tom. Uh, Tom was a just a, a great young guy. A typical, unfortunately, situation back then. I believe he was kicked out of his home or kicked out of the house because he told his dad he was gay. And I mean, he probably did too many drugs. But having said that, Tom was just you know a terrific young guy. Uh, very loyal, very friendly. Uh, and Sal took a shine to him. So I thought, well, what the hell? You know, maybe I can introduce them. So I did. I introduced uh, Tom and Sal. And uh, they hit it off. Uh, hit it off to the point where uh, Sal stayed right to the end of the night uh, and, uh, and then left with Tom. Uh, and I believe uh, Tom stayed with Sal for three or four days or maybe more. Uh, while Sal was in Toronto. I forget why he was here. Uh, but, uh, and then uh, I find out that uh, Sal took uh, Tom back to uh, L.A. with him, uh, and uh, they, um, I believe, Tom, uh, Tom, or Sal took Tom into uh, his circle of friends, Sal's circle of friends and whatnot in L.A., uh, which brings me to the tragic point of all of this. Shortly thereafter, uh, as you may or may not know, Sal uh, Minio was murdered. Uh, 
it turned out it was nothing more than a robbery gone awry, but everybody thought it had to do with his, uh, with his sexuality and uh, hookers, I guess, I don't know, or street kids, uh, tricks. Uh, but it took 10 years to solve. But I mention that because the investigating officers uh, in the uh, in the murder actually flew here to Toronto and were interviewing people. Uh, and that was kind of a sad day because I was just getting to the point where you know, I felt very, you know, it just didn't seem right uh, because he had so much more to offer. I mean, here's a young man who was considered for uh, Michael Corleone in The Godfather. He had done a couple of incredible movies, Exodus, as I say, Rebel Without a Cause, and he was doing a very controversial play, or had done or was doing, I think he had done it at this point. Yeah, he had done it. A uh, controversial play uh, in Broadway. Uh, um, uh, oh my God, I can't remember the name of it now. Uh, something, Men in Golden Eyes. Oh, uh, look it up, you'll find it. Forget about it now, or forget what it was now. And a young Don Johnson played the young, uh, young trick in that, in that stage play. Uh, it, was, uh, it was quite fascinating, to say the least, uh, when you look at his career and the fact that I had the good fortune to, uh, to meet him here and speak with him and get some things confirmed about uh, uh, James Dean. So, you know, I hope that gives you uh, some insight into the man and the fact that these two guys literally probably of their own uh, you know of, of, of their own doing really you know set a benchmark in film uh, and it's even more remarkable when you think that James Dean only made three films East of Eden, Giant, and Rebel Without a Cause that's it and you know his name and you know he's a film icon but just think how impactful he must have been in the film industry to have the reputation he has with only three films. And of course, Sal Mineo played a big part of it because James Dean died, I think, about two weeks before Rebel Without a Cause was released. So, very interesting little time in my life, and I'm happy to share it with you. Thank you, and hopefully we'll come up with some more tomorrow and or the next day. Bye-bye.